What's up everyone? Who thinks trains are pretty awesome? Maybe you played with trains a lot as a kid, liked watching them in movies like the Polar Express, or actually traveled in a train to go somewhere. Now the coolest train I've ever ridden was in Switzerland above the clouds. It took my breath away, literally. Now the reason I bring up trains is because I want to make a connection to the Israelites. Let's think of the train as the Israelite people and the tracks as God's ways. While the Israelites were under Joshua's leadership, they were on track. They were headed in the right direction as they followed God, obeyed Him, and loved Him with their whole hearts. As a result, God gave the people victory over victory over their enemies, and He helped them take over the promised land. They were enjoying life and smooth sailing through it. But once Joshua and that entire generation who saw God's awesome power died, another group of people grew up who did not know the Lord. These Israelites did evil things and they worshiped other gods. So not cool. So these Israelites got completely off track. They were headed in the wrong direction and were just completely disobeying God. You know what happens to a train, right? When it gets off track, it crashes. It's completely destroyed. And as the Israelites went off the rails, it was just no good. Not just one car is affected when a train goes off the rails, but all of them. Think of the Israelites like that. And because the Israelites were disobedient, the Lord allowed their enemies to defeat them. They suffered a lot because of it. So they cried out to God, God help. God heard their cries for help each time and showed them mercy by sending them judges. These judges were leaders over the people who would help to keep the peace and set Israel free. So God was sending these judges to help them. They would help them get back on track. But Israel would do evil again once the judges died. And then when God sent a new judge, they get back on track. It was a flip-flop process. At this point in our story, in Judges chapter 6, Israel did evil and was off track again. So the Lord allowed a group of people called the Midianites to bully Israel for seven years. The Midianites were really, really mean, and the Israelites hid. Every time the Midianites came and invaded the land, they would kill the Israelite animals and steal things, destroy things. It was so terrible. Think about the meanest bully you've ever met or heard of. Okay, bullies, they're known for ruining, stealing your lunches, ruining your clothes, messing up everything, and calling you mean things, right? The Midianites were a hundred times worse. They were terrible. So the Israelites cried out to God. God heard their cries and went to appear to a man named Gideon. Gideon was just an ordinary guy minding his own business, taking care of some wheat. And now we're going to pick up our story. So in Judges chapter 6, verse 12, this is what the Lord tells Gideon. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Excuse me, Gideon said, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders our ancestors told us about? But now the Lord has abandoned us and has given us into the Midianite hand. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's power. Am I not sending you? Excuse me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will defeat all of the Midianites, leaving none alive. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Kids, we see two very interesting things happening here, for, right? First, God appears to this man named Gideon. He is an ordinary man. He's a nobody. He's not famous. He's not strong. He's weak and small. He's not well known at all. What does God say to Gideon? He calls him a mighty warrior. Uh, last time I checked, I don't think Gideon has fought any wars, and he's definitely not come back as this amazing victor, but God's saying, 
Whether you see it or not, Gideon, you are a mighty warrior. I see what is inside you. I see your potential, and this is who you are. Gideon probably laughed at that and was just so doubtful that this was true. And then God goes on to say, Gideon, I'm sending you to go free the Israelites from the Midianites. Remember, the Midianites are the meanest bullies alive, and they're huge. This is impossible. So Gideon was like, what? I can't do this. But God said, yes, I'm sending you. And of course, Gideon asked God, oh, you're going to have to prove yourself to me. I need you to show me a sign that you are really sending me. God did his miracles, did a few miracles like he usually does. And this convinced Gideon. So Gideon decided to follow God and believe in him. Then Gideon rallied all of the Israelite troops. He got the entire army together to prepare to fight the Midianites. So let's keep reading in chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would brag against me, saying, My own strength has saved me. Now tell the army, anyone who's afraid may turn back and go home. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. So Gideon took the rest of the men down to the water. And of course, God has an incredible sense of humor. Do you want to know the way God separated the army? Well, he divided them based on the way they drank water. Yes. So if you went down to a lake or a river, I'm asking you, how would you drink water? Would you go on your knees and scoop it up with your hands, lapping it like a dog? <laughs> or would you just stick your face straight in the water and start gulping? Okay, so this is pretty funny stuff, right? God says, okay, we're going to use these men to fight against the Midianites. After this, Gideon was left with an army of 300 men. It started with 32,000 and went all the way down to 300 men. Does this make sense when preparing to fight the biggest enemy of their lives? Absolutely not. You would need every man that you could get to fight. But here God is weeding out the army, making it really small. Hmm. God wanted the Israelites to depend on his power and strength. Can you guess how big the Midianite army was? Any guesses? It was gigantic. The Bible says that they were as numerous as the sand on the seashore and as thick as a swarm of locusts. Locusts are these really big flying bugs. So in other words, the Midianites could not be counted. 300 men versus a bajillion? I don't know. Sounds pretty scary to me. So once Gideon got those 300 men together, he gave them torches, jars, and trumpets. They didn't have swords, but they had these torches, jars, and trumpets. Hmm. Once they surrounded the camp, they blew their trumpets, smashed their jars, and raised their torches. They shouted, for God and for Gideon. Guess what happened? God caused the enemy troops to fight each other. And then they started running away. Gideon and his army chased after them until all 135,000 of them were killed. Wow, 300 men plus God's power defeated 135,000 enemy troops. That's incredible. God gave Israel an amazing victory that day. They were extremely outnumbered. So this story shows us how God uses the weak and uses the small things to show his power. Gideon wasn't an experienced military leader. He wasn't this strong guy, and this army wasn't very big, but God used them anyways. So I want you to think of times in your life or areas in your life where you are weak in, where you need God's help. I want you to know that it's okay to be weak. It's okay to not always be Mr. Tough Guy or to always have the right answers. 
but God wants us to lean on him and depend on him for strength. God is with us and God is helping us. Whether you are not very good in school, sports, or sometimes you get angry really quickly, or whatever it is, God wants you to know that he's there to help you and he's there to give you his power. Our main point for today is God is strong in me. Let's say that together. God is strong in me. All right, kids, we've got an awesome science experiment for today. We're going to be playing with some oobleck, which is a combination of cornstarch, water, and food coloring. Maybe you've made it before at school or at home. It is so much fun. The unique thing about oobleck is that it is both a solid and a liquid at the same time, meaning I can punch it and look, my hand isn't wet, right? Maybe just a little bit, but it's solid. It is rock hard, but I can also sink my hand deep in it and it's liquid, meaning look, it's dripping off my hand, it's liquid but it's also solid at the same time, meaning I could make a ball with it and let it just dribble off my hand. This reminds me of what we've been learning today about the combination of being both weak and strong at the same time. It is when we are weak that God is strong in us. It's not an either or thing, but it's a unique combination. Remember that it's okay to be weak because that's when we experience God's strength. Are you guys gonna make some oobleck at home? I hope so. Our memory verse for today is 2 Corinthians 12, 10, which says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's say that together. 2 Corinthians 12, 10, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Let me go ahead and pray for us today. Jesus, I thank you so much that you are here to help us in our weaknesses. I thank you that you want to show us your power and give us strength in the areas that we need help in. May we try not to do this life alone, but involve you in every part of it. We love you so much, Jesus, and I pray a blessing over every kid. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everyone, and I'll see you next Sunday.